Good evening, everybody. Um, we would like to start. Um, today, uh, in our series of lectures, we have um, a French colleague, Eric Lapierre, standing next to me. He is, um, I think, also my age, same generation, the same generation, more or less. Um, has his office in Paris uh, and founded his office also in 2000. So now, meanwhile, 16 years. And uh, he has a very special profile. So he's an architect, but he's not only doing architecture. So uh, he's also doing music productions. He's writing. So it's quite a mixed profile. I once got a CD from him, which I which I also listened once or twice, uh, but for the rest I don't know that much about your music productions. <laughs> so architects and music is of course a very special uh, topic also. And of course he's writing, so he's also yeah, very much interested in history and theory, and um, uh, publishes also, is also curating, so you did you know, curating of uh, exhibitions also in the Pavillon de la Sonale in Paris. Um, and, um, but core business, I would say, still is architecture and maybe teaching. Teaching is, yeah, yes. it would also be interesting maybe for discussion yeah, what we are doing, has more time in teaching or in conceiving buildings. Um, so he's teaching in Marla Valley. Um, he was teaching in Medellin, I think. He yeah. stopped that. Yeah. Uh, he's teaching from time to time in Montreal, <coughs> um, giving guest critiques in uh, several universities, also in Lausanne, in Zurich. Um, and um, yeah, I already explained, um, you know, the topic uh, actually of the atelier, who is more or less in writing, so it's about a new form of public, what we are searching for, what is public nowadays, what does public architecture mean, and um, yeah, I'm quite sure you can make an interesting statement to this. And um, I yeah, just give you the microphone and um, okay. thank you very much. Thanks, André, for presentation, invitation. Uh, good evening. Uh, so, we're going to talk about the issue of monument uh, through three projects we have done in my office that, in a way or another, uh, involved this issue. Uh, actually, this issue of monument. Maybe it tends to be a strange one now, uh, in a time in which many buildings that are, or that maybe in the traditional mean of the word, shouldn't be monuments, try to be, on a formal level. Uh, other kinds of buildings that are maybe contemporary monuments, due to their importance in uh, our lives and connections, uh, are not considered as monument, as objects. So probably monumentality is facing a kind of crisis through which it could be maybe reinvented, at least uh, redefined. And uh, that's uh, the issue of tonight, probably. To try to launch such a discussion or such a reflection. When you see this, yeah, on a European level, can be considered as one of the monuments, one of monuments that everybody loves in a way. As architects, of course, it's kind of dream. Uh, getting into this building in in Roma, you never wonders who built this. I mean, we really don't mind to know this, we don't know it, and really, we, we really don't know. Uh, obviously, it's a building that's, that is a true monument through the, the, the fact that it goes really beyond the issue of personality and personal uh, work of art or personal signature. It's really an empire, a culture, a collectivity that has brought to reality this amazing building. And it's still uh, amazing, also due to this 
unknown paternity in a way and uh, to, to this collective paternity. When you look at the Roman Pantheon, it's monumental through the sites. Uh, for a long time, we, we won't be able to build uh, uh, such a cupola. Even uh, the Brunelleschi's one in Firenze is slightly uh, smaller, in, uh, almost in a kind of superstition. <coughs> and uh, so it's monumental through the size. It implies a very specific structure. It's really uh, the biggest building, the biggest cupola Romans were able to do. It's really something on the edge of possibilities. It, 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 it creates also this extraordinary uh, character that traditionally has the monuments. And uh, it's completely out of time, in a way, it's all but, uh, it's in a way eternal, permanent. And you can see this as well <coughs> through the materiality. All the columns at the entrance are made of a single piece of stone, which is in itself, of course, amazing, because it's so difficult to build, it's so precious, it's so difficult to carve and so on. So, in a way, this difficulty to build it gives it, once again, an extraordinary character. And of course, if we talk about monument, usually it means we, it's to make an opposition between monuments, which are exceptional buildings, uh, extraordinary, at the, the real, uh, very sense of the word, it's extraordinary, and it's permanent. Nobody never destroys a monument, except in wars or uh, in earthquakes or don't know what. So this is what is or what used to be a monument. Now we are facing a contemporary condition, and uh, this contemporary condition could be defined as. Uh, ordinary condition, an overall ordinary condition. We have built more during the 20th century than we had built during the whole humanity history, which means obviously that the fact of building something uh, cannot mean anymore the same thing as before. If you look to the history book of architecture, you will see an history dedicated to exceptions, only exceptions. Uh, an historic building is a very idiosyncratic one. And so, history of architecture actually is made of a few buildings, very, very exceptional and very idiosyncratic. So, the value of history, of historic buildings uh, is exception. And now, of course, we are building, since the 19th century, but especially since the 20th century, we are building huge masses of buildings. So, of course, the value cannot be the same, because it's almost impossible to be an exceptional building when you appear in a so huge amount of buildings. And of course, it seems maybe to you that, um, I don't know, the last, in, or maybe something like Rolex Center in Lausanne, which is kind of exceptional and at a certain, in a certain point, in a certain way, uh, that could uh, fulfill the traditional definition of monument. Um, it appears to you that maybe this building in 20 years, 30 years, will still be on the map as it is today. Maybe. And it's worth to, to, to be. No? But maybe not. If you consider, for example, the work of James Sterling, 
you probably don't look that closely to James Sterling, but he was the better architect of the, of the 60s and the, the students that were students in architecture in the 60s, they were looking at James Sterling. Everybody was looking at James Sterling. Now he has almost disappeared from the radar. His buildings are as good as ever. They are super good. But more or less forgotten because so many other things, so many other inputs have been done since. But since, it means since 40 years, 30 years. It's a very short time uh, in a historic uh, uh, site. So in 30 years, maybe everybody will have forgotten Sijima. Even Remkolas, few less. But for sure, maybe Remkolas won't be so dominant as nowadays. Right now, he's, he's already a bit less than it used to be, than he used to be. So, <clears throat> of course, this condition informed the, the fact of building, and especially building a monument, because now, probably, what is valuable is the typical against the unique, it's the mass against the few. Uh, and the few and the unique is difficult for it to exist. Probably it's the reason why all those buildings are desperately fighting to be noticeable and they are, uh, for this reason, they are made in, with those so bizarre forms and so spectacular ones. It's also a way to try to exist in a condition in which they can't exist anymore. And uh, of course, monumentality is completely opposite to uh, quantity. In a way, nowadays, we want to make so many monuments. If you calculate it in, only in France, for example, those last two years, we have at least three buildings considered as new major monuments. They will be forgotten soon, but uh, Fondation Vito by Frank Gehry, uh, Philharmonie de Paris, the huge music uh, auditorium by uh, Jean Nouvel, and uh, Musée des Confluences by Cor Pimelblau in uh, Lyon. Three buildings, three buildings completely, let's say, deconstructed on a formal, on a formal level, super spectacular. But when you look to those buildings, actually you get in and the material, they are the same that in social housing. Same plasterboard, same metal uh, doors. It's almost the same. I mean, the monumentality linked to a very specific materiality and a very precious one, like the columns of the Pantheon, or like the Paris Opera from the 19th century that was built in huge pieces of marbles which is built for eternity. I mean, you, you, you look at it, you, you understand it. it, it, it it's a, a, a huge amount of stone first. This doesn't exist anymore. And maybe sometimes a small private building can reach this point of very exceptionality in materiality, but the new public monument, very rarely, of course, probably you will find one, but it's not the contemporary condition of monument, which means, in a way, the monument nowadays has to be uh, redefined, because in its 19th century exception, it doesn't exist anymore, in a way. And uh, uh, that's the reason why I consider, for example, that Frank Gehry's building or Zaha Hadid's building are more or less on, at a certain level. On the conceptual level, they are 19th century buildings. They're completely looking uh, back, not looking in front, despite the, the strange look. So, in this contemporary condition, um, how can we deal with the collective feeling of a monument? How can we still 
uh, be in touch with the history of architecture? How can we still make architecture in, in as uh, when con uh, while considering architecture as a autonomous discipline with uh, it, its own theories and uh, its own history? And uh, so I will I will show you three buildings. One built, one win, but one won, but not built, and one lost. Uh, three different kinds of monuments in a way. One which is uh, too small to be the monument it should be. One which is uh, located in a space in which it was at the beginning impossible to think a uh, monument there because it's in a really, really messy and ugly periphery. And uh, one which is too monumental uh, to be accepted in a way, so uh, for which we had to invent a kind of soft monumentality. And this one will maybe interest, in, interest you more because it's a mosque. That's the reason why it couldn't be so monumental in the French contemporary uh, situation. So, uh, at the beginning, actually, we had a look to this Robert Smithen text that you can read, the monument of Passai Park in uh, New Jersey. New Passai Park is a really uh, messy uh, landscape in uh, uh, New Jersey, as New Jersey has so many. And uh, Robert Smithen uh, ramble around and uh, try to imagine in which way this territory uh, could be considered uh, as having its own kind of monuments. This is one of them. So, uh, read this, it's really interesting. Uh, on another hand, I had a look to another piece of art by Mario Merz, uh, so the art of our artist. Se la forma scompare la sua radice eterna, which means if the form disappears, its root is eternal. And in a way, uh, in my office, as well as through those buildings, we are looking for this root. Hmm? Because uh, we still trust uh, the possibility of making architecture despite these conditions. And I think this condition, this ordinary condition, is a way as well as reconsider architecture, to reinvent it from scratch in a way, not from scratch, but uh, almost from scratch. And uh, uh, for sure, an architecture um, which quality can rely on uh, uh, the quality of material, of quality of uh, exceptional uh, disposals, but quality can rely on more conceptual uh, disposals because uh, we never have money for, for building, in the, usually. So, this first building was is an art center dedicated to photography, which is located in Cherbourg, which is a city uh, on the channel facing England, um, in uh, Normandy. And uh, it's, uh, it's located, oh, I don't have, uh, it's located on a street which is almost a road, despite the fact it's close to the center. But Chabot is a city uh, in Normandy, so Normandy has been uh, uh, largely uh, demolished uh, during the last uh, World War. Uh, but <laughs> Chabot wasn't. But uh, as many other French cities that hadn't been demolished uh, during the war, at the end of the war, uh, they considered that the cities that had been demolished uh, had a kind of opportunity to make a new city uh, on the ruins. And uh, the, the cities that had, hadn't been demolished sometimes demolished themselves after the war to have the same opportunity. This city, it's like this. When you get out, the first time I went there, I get out of the railway station and due to the location in Normandy and due to the landscape, I, I discover 
getting out of the station, I was thinking, wow, here, everything, everything was destroyed. It, 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 it was a mess, probably, but not just uh, a wheel. So it means in the center we have a condition almost like a kind of roadside uh, condition. Like uh, uh, so, it means uh, it means all these buildings on the other side of the streets are uh, commercial retail sheds, and uh, this one is a former convent of the 19th century in which the art school is located. And my building, of course, is the black one. So it's uh, it's uh, uh, a site with two sides, uh, a garden and a convent on one side, and on the other side, a kind of uh, Robert Venturi uh, landscape, uh, as uh, the one that Venturi is um, analyzed in uh, Learning from Las Vegas. We have a, an authentic McDonald just on the other side of the street, which in a way was a kind of luck. And our building is just on the right behind the, the panel. So it's like this. You see all the commercial retail sheds and the convent and the building. And the issue was to know in which way to create a monument because this building was supposed to uh, be the first sign of, of, a, of a new uh, of the new future for this site, for this area of the city. And uh, in those conditions, we, we were supposed to create a monument. And um, how do we make a monument facing a McDonald's, for example? <coughs> and uh, as well, how, how do we make a monument with a small building? Because it's... Uh, 600, 600 square, square meters, so in a way it's a kind of large house, <coughs> more than a monument. Uh, the other issue was to know in which, which, <coughs> which form and in a way in which uh, uh, architectural vocabulary can we use facing Malcolm or facing thoughts. It's kind of contemporary message. Actually, uh, it was important to us that this art center uh, <coughs> did not appear in the end as a kind of very precious object that would have uh, scared everybody to get it. We wanted to make uh, something uh, that would be... Um, that that it would be kind of natural to find this object in this in this context. So <coughs> we we wanted we want to to make it actually uh, in a way in which it could explain that the neighbors were more beautiful than it, and the neighbor would explain that it was more beautiful than them. In a way, in a kind of relationship. Actually, it's the German artist Joseph Beuys that explained this about the Greek temple. He explained that the Greek temple is more beautiful than the olive tree beside it and that the olive tree explained that the temple is more beautiful than it and then it creates a unity. We were looking for this unity but not with the Greek temple nor with an olive tree. <laughs> Just with a McDonald's and a poor art center. <laughs> uh, so, we, we began by uh, making this square and to consider that the plan uh, could be um, displaying a level of abstraction and of uh, formality that would give a kind of monumental feeling to the whole. Uh, I mean, <coughs> in a way, a monument it's a building in which usually it's not that easy to understand the function of the building. In a way, we could say that the more monumental is a building, the less, then and the more difficult it is to understand its function. And on the other end of this line, you would have the, the housing. Usually housing, it's completely obvious that this is housing. This is the less monumental and the more 
obvious uh, function in a way. Uh, so we were looking for a kind of abstraction through the, the organization of the plan and abstraction and a kind of way of being not directly linked to the function. And actually, uh, a monument is, it seems we could say that it's never a functionalist building. A monument, it has to last long. It lasts in a way to last forever. And uh, as Aldo Rossi has explained, the functionalism, the hardcore functionalism, the one that, that thinks that form follows function to the point in which, to which a building is, is a kind of tool, then of course a tool is perfect to do one thing, but you can you can do anything else. And if you consider that a building lasts long, especially a monument, through, through history, maybe it will change uh, of uh, destination, it will change of function. And uh, Rossi took the example of the Palazzo della Ragione, which is a kind of a courthouse from the Middle Age, uh, and uh, then turned into other things by Palladio in, uh, in Vicenza. Um, so, through this abstraction of the plan, we were looking for a kind of separation between the plan, the form, and the function. Of course, I don't mean we were trying to make something completely anti-functional, but anti-functionalistic, yes. So we take this square, we cut an edge here, a corner, because uh, it's only dedicated to um, temporary exhibition, so it has to, to display this kind of uh, uh, neutral space, a white box, let's say. And all those white boxes uh, are the same everywhere. So, we decided to cut this to give a kind of strange identity to the outside, but as well to give an identity to this large white room. And of course, you can, it means you can display photography here, here, and here videos, for example, or you can consider that you display something continuously in a kind of wall which is larger than the building. Actually, we were looking for a kind of uh, a specific neutrality, you could say. Something which is neutral, but maybe not completely uh, without uh, any specificity or specific character. Uh, and then we divided the plan in two parts. A room, then the other part divided in two parts. A room, divided, a room, divided, a room kind of automatic writing like this. And then on the upper part, the two exhibition rooms, which are the two largest ones, are on double high. And the other part of the program is divided again in two. But we just turn the system 90 degrees, which means this room is the same, which is the lobby, is the same as the library, which is just above it. Same geometry, but not the same level, not, neither the same orientation. So actually, as everything is the same, you feel more the differences between the landscape and the condition of being on ground floor on the first floor. Then, we wanted to make this building completely unitary. It's only 600 meters per square meter, so we didn't want to, to split it in two parts, for example. But we had to face two very different contexts. So on the park and the convent on the left, it looks as a kind of uh, huge house, two large house, like this. And on the street, it appears to be a small retail shape, uh, something too small. In the, compared to the scale of the other ones. Also something which form is linked to this mountain. This mountain is the only mountain of, the, of this very flat. Uh, they named this the mountain. I mean, so. Me, I'm from Pyrenees, so I didn't think it was a mountain. 
And then those two systems are linking in a completely um, chance way. I mean, not controlled. I mean, we have designed the house, we have designed the shed, and then we have automatically linked those two parts. And we were looking there to, to stick and to be, let's say, to be a kind of uh, analog to the surrounding, where the buildings are completely messy and not well designed and with many mistakes. And it was a kind of voluntary mistakes. Not exactly a mistake, actually, because if, as high architects, we can't do ordinary architecture. It's impossible for us to create ordinary architecture. Ordinary architecture is not made by architects, or it's made by architects that are not aware of doing it. But ordinary means unconscious, in a way. And uh, architects is supposed to mean aware. So we didn't try to mimic ordinary architecture, but we were looking for a process in which we could reach a kind of a bit clumsy and inelegant solution to be more contextual in this context of uh, uncertain objects. And then we were we had to face the so no at the. Uh, for this form, this volume is, we were looking for something familiar to this surrounding. But then we had to assume to be a public cultural building facing private ugly uh, ones. How can we exist there without being hegemonic? Because of course, in, in, a, in, a, in a way, uh, the idea of monumentality is in itself hegemonic. I mean, the monument don't mind, doesn't mind of the context. The, 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 the monument is completely um, anti-contextual very often, and in, in its essence, due to its size and to the, the, the extraordinary character, uh, of course, it's anti-contextual. And uh, in a way, when Ren Carlos wrote Bigness, it was a text in which he said fuck context. But this fuck context didn't mean that Carlos didn't, didn't mind about context. And many of his buildings actually are brutal, but super contextual. No, it, it just meant that beyond a certain scale, a building cannot consider the context because the context will be itself when the building will be built. So you, you don't have and you even can't uh, consider the context when you make such a huge building. So the, in a way, this bigness text is important for monumentality in the contemporary condition because it was describing the condition of monument buildings that are monumental through the size but not through the function. Because, of course, the traditional function of a monument is a public one, a collective one, a public one. But what happened now, for example, when Amazon is building uh, a new shed, let's say 200,000 square meters? What, 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 then, what happened there? It happens that what, when it's done, the landscape is Amazon. The whole area is Amazon. And, uh, but it's not monumental. It's not monumental in, in the representation of this architecture because it's just a box. But maybe it's monumental because, uh, in a way, even if we, we're not happy to consider this, but Amazon, in a way, it's also something that links us nowadays. As the public space, the physical public space, uh, continue to do and used to do. But in this room, many of us have ordered a book, a record, or something on Amazon this week. Me, I have, and I'm sure uh, many of us. So it, it's, a, it's a collective experience nowadays. So, but those buildings that they are, they are building, they are super huge, 
but they are nothing. And in a way, you never see them. But maybe they are the contemporary invisible monuments. Huh? So, we, we didn't want to make such a hegemonic building, of, especially with 600 square meters, we didn't have the same problem anyway. But, I mean, I mean, we could have done it in a kind of exclusive way. And we wanted this building to give it an image that would be assuming its cultural and public dimension, but we didn't want it to be scaring for people, actually. In a way, because it's uh, the association running this building uh, intent to make the larger public and the larger audience discover contemporary photography. So it's not that easy. So we didn't want the building uh, to be a kind of break to this experience, but something more stimulating. So that's the reason why we were looking for this strange monument, assuming monumentality, but not in a kind of hegemonic way. So which materiality we took that Material. I don't know if you have this in Germany, probably it's not, it's not good enough for you, for Germany. <laughs> it's, it's almost like if I show you a piece of plastic that we use in a bottle of water, <laughs> not in a nursing so. so it's uh, just a waterproofing system uh, that you have on very poor building, just on very poor uh, flat roofs, like a small garage uh, and so on. Uh, it's, uh, let's say, five mi uh, four to five millimeters tar, protected by a sheet of uh, aluminium that is then, uh, I don't know how well in English, but pressed to, to have this kind of chocolate uh, aspect. And this object is that large. So I think it's a building, it's a material which is a very, very, um, a kind of untouchable material. Really ugly, and it's always in ugly conditions. So actually, it's a material that nobody never looks at it, but everybody actually knows it, because everybody has a, a piece of this at home or a piece of it uh, from his build, from his office. He's looking to a flat roof, and then they are always kind of piece of this kind of crap, you know. So. Actually, nobody is conscious of it, but everybody knows it. And uh, we were looking for this kind of experience to make this building seen from seen from afar. It's a bit strange. You are wondering what's this strange aspect, <coughs> as well because uh, this in this uh, this city is almost built in the middle of the sea, so the sky is permanently changing. You can have sun, and then half an hour later it's, it's cloudy, and then sun again, and then, and then rain, and it's really ever-changing. And it's not mirror, of course, but it's reflecting, and then the building takes the color of the sky. So it's also, it turns the building into a kind of machine to, to, to talk about the color of the sky, and uh, which is a way also of being in this ter territory. Um, but of course, silver for us was also important to, in the link with the silver salt. You know that uh, photography is made, the traditional photography was made by silver salt. And then I had also some obsessions about some spaces that have been uh, important to me in different ways. You talk about music, uh, uh, Andre, and then of course the Velvet Underground was one of my first uh, really blowing my mind with aesthetic experiences uh, and you know that at the beginning it happened in this silver space of the Andy Warhol's factory and then in a different way uh, the, I, I loved this uh, picture of Sigo Cleverence in his own completely blind uh, office with this silver insulation under the roof and then this building in which André has his own office in the Van Mel factory, this functionalist masterpiece in Rotterdam, which is a so amazing building. And on the back facade, actually, I, I had not the precise picture. <coughs> in the back facade, for 80 years now, they paint, sil they silver paint and silver paint 
I don't know, very often because it's super clean. And, uh, and then the painting, this silver painting is making the whole form completely soft because uh, in the end there are too many layers. And uh, it's something which uh, building important to me. And of course, this Philips Pavilion that Le Corbusier built with Xenakis uh, in uh, exhibition in Brussels in 1958, uh, yes, 58, and uh, that was completely uh, painted, silver painted uh, concrete. So uh, this material was as poor as the uh, roof of the McDonald's. Actually, it's almost the same. Actually, but in the silver version. So the silver version gave to the building this kind of extraordinary uh, look. Uh, but it's at the same time it's as poor as the mantle. And uh, on the other hand, uh, it's also uh, create this experience that from seen from afar you are wondering what what it is, and then seen from closer, then you recognize it. And you try to understand that, ah, yes, it's this material, it's funny, because I never noticed it could be interesting, maybe. And I never noticed it could be nice, and so on. And in a way, uh, it's a kind of decontextualization of material. And you, you, you find out a new meaning through this decontextualization. And in a way, making a picture, a photography, it's taking a frame. Bring it, bringing it out of the context, and then it, it's an image. And uh, so it's, in a way, it, it was also inspiring, inspired by, uh, by photography, and uh, we made it as clean as possible, but of course with this material it's impossible to make something completely clean, and uh, it's in a way kind of brutalist a, way, uh, uh, a bit. Uh, but also this uh, kind of uh, unprecise construction uh, works better with the, the old walls and so on. So actually it's at the same time a bit futuristic, a cheap futu futuristic, uh, and uh, working with the history. And then it's this kind of brutal abstract, at the same time abstract and concrete volume that change color uh, with the the the, the light. And uh, another way in which this building was maybe monumental, but in a way once again very you know, modest monumentality, was in the fact that it appears as modern. We only use modern to work in my office, and that one was like this, 1 to 100. It's very small, and it's the model that uh, helped us to make the building in a way. And um, actually, usually you make the model to make it appear as the building. That's the first step we've done as well. But once we had the, the model, then we decided to make the building exactly or almost exactly uh, as the model, which means with no details. So you see the real building, and the, the, in, the, in the model, there wasn't any floor, and you see the continuity of the desk into the, into the model, and then it's like this, in, you can see it very precisely actually here, but the, the tar of, the, of the, the parking is getting out into the, the, the building, and, and the, the, the exhibition rooms have the same material as the, the parking. In a, to also express the continuity of public space. In a way, it's a kind of primitive hut that we could, maybe once, we just have to remove it to, to bring it in another place. So it's like this. Uh, this is the model. This is the building. So you see, of course, we have some details more, but not that much. <laughs> Uh, so, but actually, what was it? It, it meant, it means actually a building uh, is abstract as well because it is monumental maybe as, as well because it's, it's abstract. It seems strange because it's abstract. It's 
it seems that there isn't enough details or something a bit strange. Of course, you can do this by making this kind of white concrete blocks floating on a... Okay, for me, I have no money for this and neither no will to do it. We wanted to, to, to reach an abstraction through very poor means. And uh, inside then, we, we also convey some precision in the details. And this precision gives the building and this space a kind of monumental stage, a kind of <coughs> dignity in a way. For example, we haven't used a single plasterboard uh, panel in the, in the whole building and no silicone. And uh, so it means it's cheap. It was very, uh, it was a very low budget, but we've made those partitions by with wood, very simple wood, not expensive one. But the precision of the way in which it's done gives this a kind of dignity. It's not made just like this. It's obviously somebody has taken care of this. Because uh, if, if somebody do doesn't do it, it's not like this. So through the precision of construction, we, 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 we gave, we convey this feeling of monumentality. So sometimes it's precise and a bit uh, rough, like this concrete that has been poured in the same material of the facade. But, uh, it tries to be precise. Then, in a way, we could we could summarize the thing in, in that way. Uh, our building is uh, way the smallest monument you can do, and uh, exactly like uh, Ramant uh, made this tempietto, it was the smallest building, monumental building that you can build while respecting the uh, proportions and systems of modular proportions of the classical architecture and uh, but through its skin it's completely extraordinary like this Meret of uh, work that you probably know well and inside we have this captured uh, wall and uh, the tar on the on the floor And those rooms that are the same, one in the trees and one on the ground floor. So, that was a building that was too small uh, to be a monument, and we tried to make it more monumental through a series of decisions. Then, we made this competition for a music center, for ancient music, but as well a contemporary one. And it was located in a very, very, especially the ugly sites. The, the uglier sites, uh, we had to ever make a project. And usually we don't have so many stuff in the center of the cities, you know. But it was really, really exceptionally ugly. You see it's a space with no density. And it's, uh, uh, this building is dedicated to people that have decided to, to, to give their life to ancient music. By ancient music we mean before 15th century. So medieval one, Gregorian, kind of, you can imagine, specific people, not completely average ones, of course. And, uh, Passionately, passionately dedicated to this, you can imagine not maybe completely fascinated by the contemporary ugliness. And then some politicians decide to bring their, their buildings there in this really super crappy uh, space. It's, it's really completely stupid. And uh, but for us, of course, it was a, a good pretext to try to find out in which way we could uh, design a monument in this, for this kind of space. Because actually, uh, uh, it was written explicitly in the brief that 
this building will be the new monuments <coughs> of this area. <coughs> but in a way, they were more or less understanding that they had made so many mistakes in this, and it was the building that was supposed to solve everything, which is, of course, impossible. Uh, so, the <coughs> this building there is a cinema, the building above mine is a casino, and on the title we should have the kind of uh, shopping mall with fake columns and some Roman uh, statues. But I mean, it's, when I tell you it's exceptionally ugly, it's really, it, it is really, it's, it's, it seems kind of moving almost. And uh, it was really the last place to imagine such a thing. And then we were really, it was really difficult. Because of course, in a way you can consider, okay, everything is completely wrong. So I made my, I made my building exactly in the way <coughs> I want to make it. And I can't solve anything, I can't say anything, but maybe I take some pleasure or whatever. But we wanted to be uh, more challenged by this territory and uh, we thought in which way we could take seriously into account the, the ask of the brief of making a monument in this, build, in this space which is the last place to build one. At, that's the time in which we have uh, been involved in uh, Robert Smith. And, um, Actually, it's a space completely big, wide open periphery, so you don't have anything to, to, to grab anything. In the, in the traditional city, the monument has an orientation. It has a front and a back, even if you usually can walk around. It has a frontality, and usually the main facade is facing the public space, usually a square or a large public space. Usually, of course, you can find some, but usually you never have a two-meter uh, wide pavement uh, facing uh, a huge monument. So you always have uh, a link between the main facade and uh, 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 an important public space. And then usually the, the traditional monument deals with verticality. Actually, we took all those criteria and we, in a way, we come to the conclusion that in this condition they had to be reversed. For example, orientation. At the time we made the project, and it's part of the ugliness of that kind of space. It's a space when you arrive there, you don't understand almost anything. And then you discuss with people in charge of it, and they explain you, yeah, yeah there will be a tramway. Tramway stop. Ah, you think, okay, that's cool, because the, the audience will come from one point, so it gives you something to orient it. Ah, yes, but at that point we will know only in two years where will be the stop. Ah, okay, so it could be maybe on that side or maybe on that side. So actually, uh, nothing gives you any orientation in the sides, and even this, the flux that, that links to this kind of space could help you, but not. So we decided to, instead of orienting the building, we decided to make more or less four equal parts, four equal facades. Instead of face, bringing a frontality, of course, what do you want to front? We have nothing to front. Even there's no geometry in this space, there, there is nothing to front. So, we couldn't uh, achieve any frontality, so we 
and we, 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 we hardly can find any relationship uh, with the public space, so we decided to absorb a kind of public space in, the, in our plot and to bring this ornament that you see on the floor, of, on the ground of the parking lot, which is in a way or another a part of this kind of monument in the, in the Great Void. And instead of dealing with verticality, we dealt with horizontality because into this huge amount of void, it's a kind of ocean of void, we were looking for a building in a way that expressed this, this void. In a way, the most monumental thing in such a place is the void itself. So we, we made this building appearing a bit like getting out from the ground. And it really links us to so <clears throat> formal solution that we never had reached before. In the plan, um, we decided uh, to uh, create some outside spaces defined by walls to create, to make the building itself create its own outside spaces. Because it's difficult uh, to, um, to imagine, for us, it was at least, uh, to imagine those people in this building, you, you have to think uh, first that those people play uh, instruments that most of us never heard before. You don't even know that they exist. For example, they play, I, of course I don't know the name in English, <laughs> a kind of uh, Renaissance flute, which is actually, which has been replaced actually uh, uh, in the later on. The, it was, it was, it's the instrument that has been replaced by the violin. So the flute has, this flute has completely disappeared, almost completely disappeared. So, well, you, you understand that it's a very specific world, and it was really difficult for me to imagine that those people playing their flute, uh, looking at the multiplex cinema uh, above the, the void, you know? It's, it was so surrealistic to imagine this, so we have defined some outside spaces controlled by our own architecture. I mean, we have created architecture voids, architecture outside. Then, uh, I'm sorry, but I couldn't find the good uh, section of my computer. But more or less, we have made this building with the geometry appearing more or less like getting out of the ground. And the building uh, is as ugly as the space that, uh, from which it was born. In a way. Uh, of course, I mean, ugly as a provocative stuff, but uh, inelegant for sure. And uh, I was talking about James Turbin before. Uh, I didn't do it by intention actually, but uh, of course it was building at a certain level linked to the 50s work of uh, James Sterling. So, no, impossible to, to tell which is the main facade. There isn't any. Uh, everything seems at the same time back and, and front. It was made of concrete and uh, kind of sculptural also building. But most important to us was this kind of profile that looks a bit like a snake that has eaten an elephant, you know, like in the Saint Exupéry's text. I don't know if you know this. The Petit Prince. There is this snake that has eaten an elephant, and it is more or less it, it's the architectural version of this, <laughs> in a way. <laughs> and the, the the main music room itself was built with very poor material, very simple ones, and uh, as well the acoustic system was difficult to achieve because. Uh, on one hand, those people playing acoustic instruments, very ancient ones, are dealing with this space, but also contemporary music with electro-acoustic uh, systems. So, 
this space was at the same time dedicated to acoustic music and electro, electro acoustic one, which are usually uh, more or less its opposite uh, condition. You, you mean uh, soft uh, spaces for absorbing spaces for uh, electricity, and you mean uh, um, what do you say in English? Not absorbing, uh, reflecting uh, space for uh, acoustic instrument. And all these were done by moving panels, very simply, and the musician can do it themselves, and um, displaying different uh, level of absorption materials. And, uh, well, it was like this. Different uh, room disposals of, of seats in the room as well. well it can, and it, it could also be uh, just a space to record uh, music. Well, so this space, this is an outside space seen from a rear sound room to avoid to, to look to what's behind the wall. It's uh, an architecture that in a way protects. And in the, in the cafe, we mixed the view of the control space on the left and of reality on the, the other part. Uh, it's not, it wasn't our intention to be, to take ourselves of, of reality, but seriously it was impossible to make those people make music in such a space. Um, so we won this competition and then the mayor decided to take the money to build a tramway. Uh, <laughs> so we, we never built it. And now he's in jail, which has been a small uh, consolation in the end. <laughs> uh, and now I'm going to show you the last project, which is a mosque. Uh, a competition we've made two years ago in Bordeaux, in the southwest of France. And uh, it's supposed to become the larger mosque in France. As you know, we are, we are in France, the, the European country uh, with the, the, the largest amount of Muslims, and we have a kind of democratic and cultural problem that in, in the way we almost have no mosques. I mean, no visible mosques. And very often those people are have to pray in garage, in very bad spaces, and usually in spaces that have that haven't been made to to do this. Uh, now it begins to change, and uh, some, I would say, brave and politically brave mayors uh, begins to build uh, mosques. And it's always very difficult for them. You know that we are facing, on one hand, um, terrorist attacks. On the other hand, we are facing an extreme right, which is really strong now. And uh, of course, those two, in a way, those two problems are the two sides of the same middle, of course. And they improve each other. Uh, and we are now a, in a very difficult political condition due to this, of course, as you know. So these issues about mosques are, in a way, more important than ever uh, in, the, in our contemporary <coughs> condition. For information, um, last, uh, last weekend, there was a large movement in France uh, for the first time, and due, of course, to the to the terrorist attacks, where mosques have opened, many of the mosques in France have opened up for the non-Muslims to host non-Muslims in the, okay, come on, come home, you will see we don't have Kalashnikov everywhere and we are just normal guys and you can drink a cup of tea and, uh, and so on. Uh, so, it's really the issue you propose to your students, of course, uh, uh, is completely uh, hot. Uh, it's really difficult. And, uh, of course, which is really fascinating for us, is that it's, uh, it implies 
it, it, it conveys some specific architectural questions. So uh, the brief was very simple. First, the name of this building was, uh, uh, I don't know exactly, I can't remember exactly, but more or less, Islamic Cultural Center, okay? Uh, not a mosque. It, it's made for uh, 1,500 uh, people, so it's really huge. And uh, it's uh, Alain Juppé, which is the former Prime Minister, which is now the mayor of Bordeaux, which is a right side uh, guy, but uh, in the traditional right, which means uh, almost left, <laughs> in a way, but which is without any ambiguity with the extreme right and uh, kind of Republican right wing. Post, post uh, Charles de Gaulle in a way, so for us it's traditional right. And uh, he's really supporting the project. <coughs> and as also the, the Imam, oh, it's important, uh, I'm sorry, it's funny, as you work with, about this topic, it's maybe important to know this context. The Imam uh, in Bordeaux is the most progressive one in France. He, he, he writes book, he talks in media, and he, he thinks more or less the same way as you and me. I mean, uh, for example, he explained to you uh, that uh, her, his daughters are wearing a veil, not an integral one, but a veil, but for sure, in the Quran, nobody in a single, any single line make an obligation for women to, to, to wear this. It's just the cultural stuff. So he explained this kind of thing, so he's really open-minded. And uh, that's the reason why he works also as, so well with uh, this mayor, and why they organized this competition. So, it was a name the mosque, because actually in the program we had a huge, a main uh, prayer room, a small for the Friday uh, pray and for Aid and uh, all the festivals, <coughs> and then a small one for daily pray <coughs> for only 200 uh, people, and uh, we had as well uh, school, a library, a restaurant, and a tea. Uh, Salon and a space as well dedicated uh, to children. So it was a complex program. So uh, it wasn't officially a mosque, or not only a mosque, and minarets were forbidden. Impossible to propose one minaret. And this even explains, well, yeah, that's, it's no problem, you know, the minority, because at the beginning we were oh, okay, no minority, it's strange, no? And, uh, and then the guy explained that, uh, no, no, you know, minaret, it was done when we hadn't any electricity or nothing, and uh, then the muezzin had to call people. Now, with contemporary technology, no need. No? We have a, everybody has a watch, so you know, the time of the prayer. Uh, everybody has internet, so you can have a specific mailing for uh, specific uh, ceremonies. So, no more minarets. We don't need them. So, this email is quite a strange one, because it's interesting to see in which he himself, he deconstructs partially uh, many, many things we can think about Islam that are not completely true, no? and, uh, as well as some things that many Muslim things think about Islam, uh, which is not completely true. Maybe. So, in this, in this condition, we had to make a large building in a new development of the city, just facing the center, in a new area dedicated mainly to, to housing. And, um, in a way, it was the contrary as the Charbon project, because we had a 
large building, and this building had to be kind of discreet and uh, not to be aggressively uh, Islamic, I would say, uh, due to public opinion. So we tried to develop this idea of soft monumentality that would be the monumentality that would be more linked to the daily life and maybe also uh, we were trying to make a building that, that would uh, add a quality to the life of everybody, not only of Muslims but even of people that never enter into it. in order, in our mind, to help the, the acceptance of the building. Because, of course, needless to say you that not, not everybody in Bordeaux is super happy with the construction of this building, of course. Uh, especially among the, the electors of the mayor that is building. Uh, so, we were looking as well uh, as this building, we had to think it's not a mosque in itself, it's a mosque built in France. So it's a mosque built in a European country uh, which has the larger Muslim population. But it's in Bordeaux, it's not in Baghdad or I don't know where. So how do we deal with this? How, do, how can we... Because but most, many, most of the mosques that are built in France currently are completely kitsch. I mean, they have all the signs uh, of uh, Islamic, culture, Islamic architecture in a very cheap way, of course, but uh, it's completely kitsch and uh, conservative. Huh? And of course, it was also written in the, in the brief that for us it was forbidden. For us it was. <coughs> That's also the reason why we have been chosen and uh, Aires Mateus was also involved in the, in the competition, I would say unfortunately, <laughs> as, he, as he won. <laughs> but uh, I mean, they had chosen architect that, uh, that, that we to, to make contemporary architecture. So we were looking for a project that would be linking Muslim and European culture, let's say, Muslim and Christian culture, let's say more than, better than European. So we consider, for example, this image of Fra Angelico, and uh, we see, uh, in a very classic way, we see the garden, and we see the enclosed garden with the fence, and then beyond the fence, uh, the nature, opposite, in a way, to the garden. And, uh, this issue of garden, of course, is important in, in the two religion. And on the left, you see uh, the Virgin Mary in his uh, garden, which is often the, the heaven. Heaven is often represented as a garden. And on the right hand, you have uh, this uh, miniature, uh, Islamic miniature from India from the 16th century in which you see the, the importance that is uh, given to the, to the garden in this culture and of course in the Muslim, in the, in the Islamic culture heaven is a garden and, um, and you see in those two pictures we have walls enclosing a garden so of course, the, what we name in French the Hortus Conclusus from the Middle Age, which is their uh, the plan of this. Uh, the, and we, we were looking for some, uh, let's say, uh, I could say some um, archaic uh, motives, but I don't mean archaic in the sense of very ancient, but uh, we were looking for some permanence, some, some deep uh, identities between the two cultures. So we identified first this enclosed garden as one of, this, of those identities. Then the other one, when we considered their Jain Hindu 
uh, and uh, temples, plants, <coughs> and as well as uh, Chambord Palace for, from uh, French Renaissance, uh, planned by Leonard de Vinci. Um, all those plans are more or less symmetrical, different kinds of symmetry, regular and very clear and geometric uh, figures. And then if you consider all those Islamic buildings, they are more or less uh, uh, linked to the same conclusion, regularity, geometry, kind of machine, geometry machine almost. No? So we decided to work uh, with those elements. Uh, yeah, it's another important thing about the context. We are on the right bank, no, on the left bank, but the bank of the river, which is on the right side of the, the, the picture. And on the left one, it's the cathedral of the city. So there's a direct view from one to each other. Which justify the kind of monumentality and the, and the possibility of, identific or, or, of uh, identifying the, the mosque from the other bank. Well, this is a, just a scheme to explain the hegemonic and anti contextual essence of a monument, which is quite good represented by that one, which is very successful and really working well on many levels hmm? and uh, which is of course uh, Frank Gehry's Bilbao. But the brief was completely leading us to, uh, if we followed the brief exactly, it was leading us to this scheme, which means a complete building of the plot and then uh, more or less a portion. So, a very classical plan of mosque, and, but with, which has the inconvenience of having very few relationship with the public space. And of course, nowadays, uh, in the contemporary France and probably Europe, the, the important thing uh, is probably to try to, to find <laughs> well, that's okay. <laughs> Sorry. It's probably to, to find the condition of a relationship of the Muslim community with its context, which are the European uh, societies. So, this kind of scheme for us was really uh, representing a kind of exclusion and a kind of separation of this building and this community from its surrounding, which appeared to us politically and culturally completely out of possibility. So, to fight against this introversion and also to fulfill the the necessity of creating regular geometric building. We have fragmented <coughs> the, <coughs> the program <coughs> in several parts. Actually, as I told you, the, the, they were asking us to make a restaurant, a mosque, and a small mosque, a large one, library, a school, and so on. So each piece is a piece of different program, so we fra fragment this. And we do this in order to try to improve the quality and the identity of each of this piece in the whole. Because actually, uh, um, actually if, 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 if we would have done this, we could have a courtyard and uh, the main room, the main praying room, which would have would have had uh, uh, um, 
a form quite regular and quite strong. But all the other part of the brief was just in the poche, you know, in the in the informal mass between the clear geometry of the main space and the border of the of the plot. And you can consider this plot wasn't really a gift. No? Because, uh, it was not that easy to to build on this triangular irregular plot. So we fragment everything and we give a specific shape to everything. And then we bring this together and it means it's topologically an inversion. Here we have topologically it's a kind of a ring which means it's all the mass is outside with a hole inside kind of donuts. And uh, here all the mass is inside and the void outside. And this void, we made of it a garden. And then this garden is in a way uh, given to the public space. Of course, it means the building and the different parts of the building are completely sunk in the garden, but as well the garden is this space of mediation between the outside space and the inside space. And uh, also it appeared to us uh, beyond the fact that we, we understood that the garden was involved in the boss culture, usually I have never met any inhabitants that uh, wouldn't be happy to have more garden, but the people are looking for gardens more than for architecture. So it was also a way of improving the acceptance of building. And then we created a wall around, a wall with many holes, and a wall which was not a separation, but which, which was considered as a kind of membrane uh, organizing the link between the inside and outside. So it's more uh, an active limit than just something that separates. And we've made a series of uh, entrances, and uh, it's too detailing, you don't mind about this. Through these walls, and despite the presence of buildings, you see that all this was uh, able to be crossed by the view. So the building was not a kind of fortress, but it was uh, something very, in a way, transparent. And this was all the different pieces, the wall, the garden, and different pieces of buildings uh, that we brought together. And it created this kind of view on the public space. So a building which doesn't seem that monumental in a way, because also the wall allows us to, to bring the building a bit more at the core of the, of the plots. And then we are, don't have better imaging, just the image of the competition, I'm sorry. And um, we created here, here, it was a huge void with a grid and it was full of birds. Because we were looking as well, the birds are really important in the Islamic culture. <clears throat> if you used to travel some years ago in Syria, or if you travel to Iran, or in many, uh, many Islamic countries, uh, people have small cages with birds. And uh, the fact of having a bird at home and uh, listening to it whistle, whistle it's really a very deep thing in the Islamic culture. For example, Taliban, when they were in charge in Afghanistan, they had, uh, of course, uh, forbidden uh, birds. But 
which means they are working, they was ready. So, uh, actually, we wanted this uh, garden as well uh, be a, a kind of this image of heaven and uh, the, the birds singing in this garden was part, were part of the project. And, uh, <clears throat> and of course, uh, this wall, which is just a, hole, a wall with holes, uh, with no windows or so, <coughs> it appeared as a kind of ruin, metaphor of a ruin, which was for us also <coughs> a way of trying to condense some time in this project uh, and to convey a feeling of permanence through this uh, metaphoric uh, construction. And these are different versions <coughs> of the walls, most of them very bad. <laughs> and then we see on the urban level in which way the, our project were, was continuing uh, a public garden project existing. And uh, we planted as well, we, we had planted uh, uh, this uh, garden with a kind of tree, specific one which is a pine tree. Because Bordeaux is just at the north of a region uh, named La Forêt des Landes, the Land Forest, I don't know if you heard about this, <coughs> the most important artificial forest in uh, Europe. And it's planted with only pine trees. So the pine, the pine tree is really belonging to the local culture and the local landscape. And of course as well, the pine tree is completely linked to the Mediterranean uh, landscape and to partly to uh, Islamic culture. So we choose, we cho chose those trees as well as uh, once again kind of link between the two cultures. Um, this is a view from the, the garden in between the wall and the building and you see the wall was kind of high. Huh? It's, uh, all this was uh, in a way monumental in the size as well. And uh, this is the... I haven't shown... No, I'm going to show you first Maybe this. <coughs> this is the overall plan. Oh, it's not. Some lines disappear here, but um, the main square, the main public space is there. So the main entrance is there in this hall. This is the main praying room, the small one, house for the custodian. The cross is the school. And the Pentagon is the uh, restaurants uh, and offices. And uh, we, we actually, all the circulation are made through this ring. Actually, this uh, corridor in the shape of a ring links all the, the different parts of the, of the building. And this is a view of this corridor, which is largely open on the garden on the left and open to the praying room, main praying room on the right, which is, of, of, of course, it's possible to close. And the praying room was relying on the five pillars of Islam, because as you know, uh, Islam is probably the sole religion which is lying on an architectural metaphor which a good Muslim has to respect the five pillars of Islam. One is uh, to make the five prayers, because also the five pillars and the five prayers uh, and, uh, and uh, going to Mecca and be good with the poor and so on. So metaphorically our building was uh, the structure was made of five pillars, like the structure of the religion itself. 
It was covered in stone because Bordeaux is a stone country, a stone city. This point was a bit for the competition and was also it's not the decision I, I, I prefer today. Uh, while preparing the stuff, uh, I was thinking that probably I would do it in concrete, but anyway, I wouldn't do it in anything. So. <laughs> so, on each level, we had a series of plates, and the, the people could pray, half of the people prayed on the ground floor, and the other part were, were praying on those different kind of plates because actually for the each Friday everybody was on the first <coughs> level on the ground floor and on the exceptional days as uh, Aid and so on all the floors were uh, occupied and then it made this because it had to be, it was possible to organize lectures, uh, discussions. It's uh, actually the, the, the space in itself, in the Muslim culture, is not sacred. Actually, they are so involved in the idea that only God is sacred, that they, they are really scared of, of gi giving sacrality to anything else than God. So, Contrary to the space of a church, for example, of a Catholic church, especially Catholic, because maybe in Protestant it's a bit, it's more relaxing, but as Catholic we are not so relaxed, huh? <laughs> as you know. So, uh, actually the, the, the space of the mosque is not uh, sacred. So it's very, very easily possible to organize completely secular, uh, discussions and um, manifestations, exhibitions, and so on. Uh, so it's the, the version uh, with uh, lecture and the version with uh, when praying. Actually, I, I have left uh, not very much underneath, but it's not. Wrong. And on the last level. We had the library. The library actually was the last, last ring. And through the windows, you had a look 360 degrees overall the whole metropolis of Bordeaux. And uh, the light was coming from this roof, first going through the books, and then going down to the praying room. So in a way, for religion which is involved in the book, uh, it was first by going through those books that the light finally reached the space for praying. So it was also symbolically, of course, for us. It was interesting. and. Um, And now I think I have nothing more to add about this attempt of soft monumentality. Thank you. Are there questions from out the audience? No one has questions, as usual, no questions. <laughs> um, I would like to ask a question to you about um, materialization of architecture, um, which I personally find quite interesting. So the first project you showed, the Cherbourg project, uh, you were describing in terms of there are certain references about the silver and uh, there's of course the McDonald's and all that kind of stuff. When, when I saw the project first, also in the book you gave me once, um, I thought that was kind of a yeah, statement about building also, about cheapness, about having no means, about, well, 
it could be read as a certain certain cynical statement also somehow you know I mean it's at the edge it balance at the edge of course it's cultivated of course it's, it's it has architectural characteristics still <laughs> but it's of course at the edge because you use a really trashy material on the outside you know? and um, in the last project you showed but also in, in, in other projects, also when we discussed in the Bordeaux Marignan project, and you showed a certain uh, admiration to, for instance, Hans Kollhoff, who is doing really architecture with permanent materials, with brick, with natural stone, and, and you also mentioned that here we are we were using natural stone, very permanent material. And of course, we as architects, we are all, of course, exposed to this circumstances nowadays, how to make architecture. So you have, we have no budget and we have to think of, do we give yeah. comments on this? We make cheap, trashy <laughs> comments. Or do we try to find just edgy, at the last moment, the possibility to make permanent architecture? And uh, I think we all, we are all kind of always searching for possibilities to to be more permanent, but on the other hand, we cannot also lie to ourselves because the, the condition is not at all permanent. Yeah? And the more politicians speak about sustainability and that kind of stuff, the less true it is, of course. Yeah? The, the less we are confronted with cheap shit every day, you know. And uh, maybe you can say something about that because I think you are reflecting a lot about this. And I heard stories also about your student housing or building now in Paris where you wanted to make cast in situ columns <laughs> where then the, the, the contractors come and repair them by hand because they're not done well and stuff like that and I, I heard from via 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 so <laughs> but because I mean also in France that's also a very specific thing that especially the concrete world is very complicated to yeah. say it softly <laughs> but maybe you can say something about that about this contradiction where we work in and where also you I think are very much struggling with. <laughs> thank you. Uh, actually, <laughs> thank you to underline my, my contradictions. <laughs> uh, uh, it's very, it's really very difficult uh, to say, to, to talk about this because we are really in a kind of contradiction because uh, with this project in Cherbourg we, we, we built with very cheap material and in a way you're right it's a kind of comment uh, about the condition could appear cynical I, I never been aware of this I wouldn't like it to be I don't think cynicism is an option for an architect, even if it's kind of trendy, because it's it's trendy because it's easy. I mean, of course, we are facing the trap, so we like it, we love it, and we make yes architecture. Eh? Okay, so uh, but uh, I think in the Chamou project, uh, this scheme uh, was linked for me to many things more. Uh, sophisticated in the one, on one hand and this outside roughness was made possible uh, through the precision and the kind of softness of the inside because inside we are also using cheap material but it's cheap plywood so it's it's uh, more valuable you know, it's, uh, it has a better image and uh, for me, the project is completely, the outside and the inside is completely <coughs> linked through their opposition. For example, I couldn't imagine this building so rough outside and uh, made of raw concrete inside, for example. It would be very, very tough, I think. And um, so it's a way of bringing a balance, I would say. And it's also, it was really a way of giving this building an identity through its materiality, which is something which is a traditional architectural theme, I mean, uh, but with really no means. Um, uh, the budget was uh, the same amount 
per square meter, we, we had the same amount as the social housing, which means more or less it was built five years ago, six years ago. We had more or less 1,600 euros per square meter, but it changes from one country to another. But it was the amount of money that we usually have for social housing. But we had technical uh, stuff very precise. With, uh, with they can they can exhibit um, very old uh, pictures from the 19th century, which means the quality of air is completely permanent, uh, moisture, uh, temperature, and so on. So it's like in a very modern museum, I would say. So then we had a lot of money for this already, and completely impossible to reduce this. And uh, so we, we we had very few money, and we tried to to give an uh, uncommon identity through this. So it's the way we, we find out. Uh, in, you talk about a project of uh, 400 student housing we are currently building in Paris. A very complex building because it's above um, um, a center for, for uh, public transportation uh, buses. So a parking, but also a warehouse to repair them and so on. So it's uh, 400 uh, student housing on top of uh, industrial building uh, at the core of Paris. And um, there uh, we have conditions that maybe we will never have anymore. It's really old-fashioned condition, which means it's a private uh, public actor, because it's the RATP, which is the public transport company in Paris, which is a very huge company and uh, very powerful and very rich. We don't have that many money, <coughs> but they facing the, the, the building company, for example, we have, as architect, we have a complete trust from our clients. We are really like this with the clients. They, they trust us from the beginning and they, they continue to do it and they, they and they let it know to the building company. So when we talk to the building company, we have a kind of power, which is the power of this, tr this trust. And this trust is the trust of uh, a really powerful company. And also a company that is currently distributing billions of euros of uh, construction to to improve and um, and extend uh, the underground system lines, for example. So we have good conditions. Um, so we, for sure, we try to have a control on this building that we cannot have in many of the buildings we we build, because often. We built for uh, developers, for example, and uh, we are we don't we have almost no power uh, on the construction site, for example. So in this uh, Parisian building, we have the power. So we try, maybe for the very last time, to make a permanent building, completely raw concrete, with all the details controlled, and. Uh, we hope with a high level of uh, quality, at least a high level of ambition and a high level of pressure <coughs> on the builders. And of course, it's a, it's a kind of... Um, it's a great pleasure to be able to work like this. On another hand, um, on another hand, sometimes I'm wondering that we... we, we we bring a high level of energy in this. We, we began eight years ago. And sometimes I'm wondering, is it completely relevant? Is it completely uh, expressing the contemporary condition? And of course, it's first of all a pleasure. Uh, so it's not nothing. <laughs> but in a way, uh, it's a so exceptional condition that I always, I almost feel as a kind of a Swiss architect, you know? and uh, actually, no, I don't feel as a Swiss architect because Swiss architects are not aware of anything in, in a way. Huh? But uh, I, I talk about Switzerland, because of course, Switzerland, as you know, is a kind of uh, 
Indian reserve for architects. I think it's, it's incredible the money they have, even if it's less than before. Uh, the money, but also the power the architects have there. In France, you have to, to understand that most of the time we explain something to a client, a client that has chosen us. Uh, he considers it. He, he asks us proofs. It, it, it's never, ah, okay, it's uh, sometimes, it's, it's rare when it goes in, in a trust. And, uh, usually, you are architect, you are considered to, to, to tell really bullshit. So, uh, <laughs> or, you, you, or you have to do exactly what everybody knows already, but which is usually not the thing you feel like to do and you don't feel it's relevant to do either. So you have to convey and to convey you have to to, to, to reach a very high level of expense of energy, let's say. So uh, in a way with uh, by building with a so high level of precision <coughs> a completely concrete building it's a bit old school project. You know. And it's a pleasure to do it, but I think the true issues are in a way elsewhere. I don't think it's... If you consider that architecture has to be permanent, to be linked to a permanent history at least, uh, uh, but uh, has to express uh, the contemporary time in which it's built, uh, building in this condition is currently not representing reality. But on the other hand, why should we have to accept the, the, the usual condition, which is especially in France, I think, especially badly, as you know, big in Paris. <coughs> so, actually, we are trying usually to fight against this condition and at the same time to try to take opportunities from this. And uh, for sure in Chambou, for example, we, if we would have more money, we couldn't build with this material. And it was interesting to discover a tectonic which is really linked as a tectonic of a paper. In a way, it's really, uh, at the scale of living, it's kind of of sheet of paper that that's wrapping the building. It's interesting as well. Uh, it also conveys some theoretical issues and aesthetic ones which are rich. Actually, uh, I think you invited Kirsten. We were talking with Kirsten Hears uh, some years ago about one of our friends uh, that had built in Switzerland a building uh, wrapped in uh, the same kind of material. And uh, with Keston, we, we didn't understand. I mean, he, he lost my building. Uh, he also used crappy materials because he has no money often to build. But we were saying, both of us, if we would have built this building in Switzerland, we would have cladded it with marble. Well, I don't know what. I mean, for me, it's not just uh, a position or saying, okay, guy, I look. Uh, I'm able to make so crappy things. No, no, it's... I had no choice in a way. I had the choice to find another one, another material, but it would have been as crappy. But when you make this in Switzerland, then... And to, huh? and of course, it's completely decadent. Yeah, that's the right word. So, we are not in this kind of position. I mean, uh, we are, honestly, we couldn't make we couldn't find a, a, a better material. So we could have chosen another one, but not, bad, not a better one. <laughs> and, uh, but you, for sure, that's also the reason why uh, it's not only the result in itself. I mean, maybe in Chambo, in this condition, what I've done has a specific meaning. And would have, if I would have done this in Basel, uh, it, it, would, it would have another meaning. So, it's difficult to talk also completely in a general point of view. But for sure the fight about your, your 
talking about it's the fight of our permanent. Uh, yeah, I, could, I have a question about, um, you gave the example of Amazon and that their um, contribution centers could never be seen as monuments because they are just huge, empty and boring boxes, um, but that Amazon is a form of collective experience. And I was wondering, is because you, um, before uh, Andre um, when Andre gave the um, introduction, he said that you also produce music, that you work as a, uh, that you do um, performances, um, or you work as a producer. And uh, I was wondering, is that the reason why? Because it's a collective experience, music, theater, or you didn't spoke about that. I was wondering what else. How is this linked to your architecture? Actually, it happens to me to be involved in music, uh, not uh, often enough, actually, but uh, music is just in... Actually, in life, I'm obsessed by architecture and uh, for a longer time by music. And uh, I was born in a kind of remote place, very provincial, before internet, so completely in a kind of uh, state of remoteness that we can't imagine now to live in a European country, uh, <laughs> actually. It's, and uh, uh, the first, uh, my first uh, encounter with culture was through uh, rock music. And I always consider this music, which is linked to entertainment and so on, but uh, I always consider it very seriously. <clears throat> I mean, uh, as something having some some rules, some history, some uh, specific things. And uh, and through the music, I reach literature and. Uh, I get involved in culture, and if I'm if I'm an architect, it's because I listen to I used to listen to Velvet Underground in my remote place. No, I, I mean it's still a joke. It's really the, the, these guys. I was in this place. I was really getting bored there. I wasn't made for that place. Anyway. Everybody was playing rugby. I didn't care about that stuff. And uh, when I discovered. Um, Music really, it, it was really a new light in my life. Huh? And uh, I had already discovered literature at school, so I was really fond of, of reading. But then uh, through the music, uh, I've been in touch with um, painting, and because uh, of course, through the Velvet Underground, I was linked to Warhol and pop art. And, uh, and then when, once you have the finger, it gets it stopped. Okay. So, for me, the, the music has been this. It's still uh, really important to me. And at a certain point, uh, I've begun to organize concerts in my buildings when conditions are gathered, not uh, for the true white developers, for example. Uh, it's impossible to find conditions to do it. But uh, in the Sherbrooke building, for example, I've done it. We recorded a record there. And, uh, and uh, usually the music we play is a kind of um, analogy of the architecture of the building. So this very, this facade, which is without, which has no articulation, which is only a material completely homogeneous, but with variation. Uh, actually, I, I invited there three <coughs> guitar, electric guitar improvisers and the play improvisation there. And it was kind of linked with this aesthetic of the building. Another, another record we are going to publish in two this year, <clears throat> we recorded in, in a house we've built, which is made of 16 equal rooms. All of them are equal in a grid. And we displayed musicians in a series of, this, of those rooms. They play and uh, 
actually uh, not of the all the musicians who were not able to listen to the other one, so they played separately. And only the public actually can listen to everything. And uh, it was a concert in which there, there, there has been as many concerts as members of, of the audience in a way. Nobody has listened to <coughs> the same thing. And this worked perfectly with the equality of the space, which is more or less non-hierarchical and uh, very homogeneous and uh, neutral. Uh, and through this neutrality, we could find a kind of expression, as well as uh, in the real space of this house, uh, this, this space has a kind of labyrinthine um, feeling, which is much more complex than the drawing of the planet. And uh, well, we've done that kind. And the next big step uh, will be in next September, probably in September. We are just uh, uh, currently making it. And we, in, in the Parisian building about which you, you talk, we will have finished the concrete. And we will organize one or two full days of music with many different bands. Some coming especially from USA and so on. It would be hardcore rock and roll, and, uh, improvisation, and noise music, and also classical one, very different kinds. And uh, of course, you're invited. But and there, there's a link actually between architecture and music, it's well known. Well known, but very few well defined. It's not that easy to find out. For me, it's just two things I love. So I try, while getting older, uh, I find the conditions to bring them together. That's not more complicated than this. <laughs> and we've begun to make something uh, which is, uh, which are uh, concert lectures. I mean, uh, uh, we have made once in Marseille with one of the guitars that has played in Charbon. And I make a lecture, but he's playing behind me. But the first time, we, we didn't dare to do it that much. So now we're going to try to fix it better. And in May, we will do it in the, on the roof of the Unité d'Habitation in Marseille. But in a more experimental way, I would say. More musical. <laughs> I think there's no questions anymore, I suppose. Um, so, thank you, thank you very much. Um, I don't know if there's still something to be said about things. things oh yes, in the upcoming semester we will organize another series of lectures. We are on the way on discussing whom we want to invite. Uh, that will be published soon, as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.